name is Volker Berkhan. I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Europe here at Columbia University. And I would like to welcome all of you most cordially, also in the name of my colleagues, especially uh, the director of the Harriman Institute, with uh, whom we are doing this together, and also my colleagues John Mitskill and Kevin Hallinan, who have been very much involved in the organization of this. Um, and I would like to welcome, of course, especially our foreign guests who've come from afar, and I hope they are not uh, too jet-lagged, because we will have, I'm sure, two uh, very interesting days of lively discussion and presentations. Uh, let me just explain what I suggest uh, might be the procedure for this first session. Uh, I would like to say a few words of introduction just to tell you about the considerations behind this particular meeting, and then I would like to ask Ambassador Blinken to say a few words uh, relating also to our keynote speaker, whom he knows well. And then I would like to introduce the keynote speaker. And if there is then time for discussion at the end of uh, his lecture, and uh, I'm sorry that we started late and uh, the microphone also hasn't arrived yet, so it's the usual problems early in the morning in this institution. But uh, at any rate, if there's time, I hope there will be some questions which uh, Professor Garty will take. Uh, otherwise, we will have to proceed to the next panel straight away. And uh, uh, then we have, of course, uh, the afternoon also. Now, to give you some background information about this, uh, there are, of course, many meetings taking place also in this town uh, this last week and this week again, uh, remembering and commemorating the events in East Central Europe in uh, 1956, exactly 50 years ago. But uh, while these are, I think, meetings uh, where there is a lot of commemoration, we thought it would be good in this institution to have a very firmly academic event also. <coughs> and uh, that is why we thought also it would be a good idea to take a more comprehensive view of the upheavals that happened 50 years ago in that part uh, of Europe. And we felt that it would be appropriate, therefore, to start our first panel with uh, the Khrushchev speech and its impact, and then uh, and that is also an intention not to keep the, uh, the Polish uh, events and the Hungarian events totally separate, which tends to uh, happen quite frequently these days, but rather to see whether the, we can also establish an intellectual academic um, dialogue between all the uh, experts who are here. Uh, and some of them will know each other already, but I have a feeling that some others will meet for the first time. And my hope is that, indeed, there will be further contact coming out of this conference, uh, both in East Central Europe, but also across the Atlantic. So uh, that was one consideration. And the other one was that we really also wanted to look not just at the latest research uh, that uh, is now being produced, and a lot of it is, of course, not available uh, to many of us who do not speak Polish or Russian or Hungarian, um, so that um, we would learn about the latest research, but we were also hoping to look at the long-term fallout, the implications of these events 50 years ago. And uh, that is why we have this uh, composition of panels. On each panel we do have also people who will be looking at the consequences of what happened. And then, as you will have noticed also, we thought it would be very important to try to put the whole, uh, these events into a global context at the end of it, and that is why we have tomorrow afternoon uh, the uh, final session, uh, and we are very glad that we persuaded Professor Bob Jervis to uh, introduce this, because I'm hoping that uh, this will also open up uh, all sorts of major questions which are of, the, of a transnational nature to look back on these events. So I hope you can see why we are really looking forward to two days of uh, good discussion, lively discussion and exchanges. Now it's a great honor for me and a pleasure to introduce Ambassador Donald Lincoln, uh, who has of course, as a New Yorker, many connections both with Western Europe, 
where he spent uh, many years earlier on in his life, but then also with East Central Europe. Uh, he is a, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Central European University and in fact uh, wanted to be here this morning, although uh, he is flying to Budapest only this evening. So I'm delighted that he's able to come. As you may know, he was also uh, ambassador to Hungary during the Clinton years. Uh, he is also, and that is what I cannot resist mentioning, uh, also the very loyal and helpful co-chair of our International Advisory Board at the Institute for the Study of Europe. And uh, I know that he's also an admirer of Professor Gatti's work, so I will hand over to him uh, to say a few words by way of introduction. Good morning. Thank you very much, Volker. I think uh, Colombia is absolutely the right place to be dealing with these very, very interesting issues stemming from what happened 50 years ago. There were two Cold War events, I think, that continue to reverberate today. One is the Cuban Missile Crisis. The other, obviously, the Hungarian Uprising and Revolution of 1956. Both of them still attract our attention, and we consider their, uh, the results of those, those episodes to be important, even today, 50 years later in one case. Russia, or the Soviet Union, was involved in both of them, so I think it's quite appropriate that the uh, the subject of today's uh, these meetings is the impact of uh, the 56 revolution and other events in Central Eastern Europe on what was then the Soviet Union and today Russia. Of course, my focus is on Hungary, where I have a little bit of expertise, not on the rest of Central Europe or the Soviet Union. If you were living in Hungary or working in Hungary, as I did in the 1990s, you could not but help be uh, aware of the fact that 1956 still hovered like a very faint cloud over all the events in Hungary. It wasn't paramount, but you knew it was there because the people both in Hungary and, and 56ers in the United States kept raising the issue of what kind of government the socialists and others would bring to the emerging Hungary. In 1996, I became aware of the fact that the Radio Free Europe tapes dealing with the Hungarian uh, uprising and, and the run-up to it were, were being moved from their their uh, storage place in, in Germany to Eastern Europe. The question was where would these tapes end up? And by chance I got in contact with Ross Johnson in Washington and the two of us agreed that the Radio for Europe tapes dealing with the Hungarian episode should belong to the Hungarian people. So we spent about a year trying to persuade Radio for Europe officials in Washington that these tapes should be turned over to the Hungarian government. And happily, after about a year's work, they were indeed uh, turned over. On May 22, 1997, I had the honor of speaking on the occasion of the return of the Radio for Europe tapes to Hungary's National Library. The return of the Radio for Europe tapes to Hungary, I noted, is an opportunity both to reconsider the past and think about the future. It is also an opportunity for the Hungarian people and Hungarian historians to regain a missing segment of the historical legacy. Recently, I, I said, I came into possession of a US government memorandum written on November 20th, 1956, which discusses Radio for Europe's role in the Hungarian Revolution. This paper states that, quote, from all information available to date, Radio for Europe did not incite the Hungarian people to revolution, end of quote. Forty years after the event, I concluded, an American cannot comment on the validity of these observations. But I believe that with the return of the tapes to Hungary, Hungarian academics, journalists, and the Hungarian people at large can examine the evidence and make up their own minds. That was 40 years ago. We're now 50 years after the event, and a lot of <coughs> A lot of evidence has been accumulated. We know a great deal more than we knew in 1996 about the Radio for Europe's role and about the origins of the uh, Hungarian uprising. What caused it, what actually happened, what might have happened. Uh, but these events, I think, are, are most beautifully summed up in Charles Gotti's very, very moving book, Failed Illusion. 
Senator, late Senator Patrick Moynihan said very famously that people are entitled to their opinions, but they're not entitled to their facts. I think that applies very, very well to Charles Gotti's role as a, as a teacher and a student and a writer. He's very much emotionally involved, obviously, in what happened in Hungary. He's a Hungarian by descent. He left Hungary during the 1956 uprising, and he has strong feelings about it. But at the same time, to his credit, he's never allowed those feelings, I think, to interfere with his academic uh, scholarship and his studious observance of the facts as he's been able to obtain them. So I think we all owe him a debt of gratitude for producing a book that clarifies what happened and leads us to certain uh, possible conclusions. One final word about uh, Charles, uh, in addition to being a wonderful scholar and writer, he's also been a mentor to many American ambassadors during the past 10 or 15 years. I know in my case, before going to Budapest in 1994, uh, I sought him out, we had some talks, and he continued to be a, a very, very important influence and source of ideas uh, on what was going on in contemporary Hungary, and I believe he's continued that role with the my successor ambassador is to Hungary, so that we owe him a, a second debt of gratitude for being an important resource for the United States Foreign Service, the State Department, on what's happening in Hungary and Eastern Europe. So with that, I'd like to say, Charles, it's, it's delighted, delightful to have you here. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much and has been a senior advisor on the policy planning staff of the State Department and he was also a professor at Union College and here at Columbia for a while. And uh, he has written of course very extensively on the events also of our conference and the larger background to this. Uh, some of you will um, know his book The Block That Failed of 1990. <coughs> Then in 1986, already he published a book called Hungary and the Soviet Bloc, uh, which won the Marshall Shulman Prize um, uh, for outst uh, as an outstanding book uh, published in the United States on Soviet foreign policy. So he's very wide-ranging in his work. And he is uh, the co-author or editor of some 16 books uh, dealing with uh, Central Europe and the problems that have preoccupied him in his scholarship for many years. And uh, Don Blinken just mentioned, of course, his recently published book, uh, Failed Illusions, uh, which was reviewed, as you will have seen it perhaps in the New York Times book review, only last Sunday. So we have a very eminent scholar to introduce this, and I'm really very glad that uh, he, we could persuade him to be here, because only if he days ago. He was also in Europe. So I'm delighted and grateful, Charles, that you were able to come here and we look forward to your talk and hope that there will still be some time for you to answer some questions also. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you very much for both of these extremely kind uh, introductions. Uh, I am uh, grateful uh, to Ambassador Blinken for having for for that. Uh, there was a reception, uh, I think, uh, just this past weekend in the White House, uh, and I, I was in Moscow where I read in, in a Hungarian daily who was invited at the White House to watch a new movie about 1956, and to my horror, I saw that uh, a former leader of the Arrow Cross Party in 1944 uh, was also there, so I'm definitely not responsible. I've already written a couple of protests about that, uh, but, you know, things happen. Uh, but thanks, Donald. I appreciate your good words, and thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me here. I particularly liked it because uh, the last few weeks, some of us, uh, several people in this audience have been giving talks about the Hungarian revolution of 1956, but usually you don't have enough time and so you get your 10 minutes or 7 minutes or at most 15 minutes. Uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations where Bob Legvold was the host, I got two minutes at a time or three maybe. Once I went beyond, he interrupted me. But I forgave him because he wrote very nicely about my book in Foreign Affairs, so uh, uh, he, he got away with it this time. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, this topic appealed to me because it is broader. 
uh, that uh, Volker gave me, and the topic is the cold, as, it, as it's in your, your uh, schedule, the Cold War in Europe and the 1956 Hungarian uh, revolt. Uh, uh, I had to prepare for this, actually. Uh, unlike some of the other talks I've given in recent weeks, I have obviously lots of notes, but I, I don't have to do separate and special preparations. I, I did have to do that. But before I get to the topic, let me just say that uh, I came from Moscow um, yesterday, arrived, and there is considerable interest there, not only in Hungary 1956, uh, uh, but also Hungary 2006. Uh, they see the situation so bad, both in Hungary and in Russia, that there are now jokes again. And I always find that a good indicator of uh, how things are going. Once they have jokes, you know that things are bad. So here is one that, uh, that uh, has something to do with both Hungary and uh, Russia that I will uh, read to you. This is supposed to be the text of a telegram sent by some Hungarians to President Putin. Quote, when your troops were here, all Hungarians were of one mind. Stop. We hated you. Stop. We were united. Stop. Since you left, we are no longer united. Stop. We hate each other. Stop. Please revoke your old decision and return immediately. Stop. <laughs> You have to be able to la laugh uh, uh, about what's going on. Well, about the Cold War in Europe, let me start out with that, obviously, uh, and make one, start out with one generalization. Uh, uh, from the end of World War II, but especially from 1947 until the death of Stalin, I think it is possible to say, with some simplification, that the Cold War was one-dimensional. It was a confrontation, not necessarily by weapons, uh, but uh, certainly it was an ideological, political, economic, and potentially military confrontation. It is true that there were some, there were some early deviations uh, uh, from the two-camp situation, which was formalized only by Zdanov and the Truman Doctrine, uh, it is true that in Hungary you had elections in 1945, those were quite free, uh, and even in 1947, which is still competitive, not, uh, not quite free, Czechoslovakia in 1946, and of course in the West the uh, Italian and French communist parties were very much able to compete uh, uh, for power and challenge centrist and right-wing uh, parties. Uh, at the same time, the Soviet Union, as we now know, uh, financed the Italian and to a lesser extent the French Communist parties, while the, uh, while the United States in Western Europe was financing the Christian Democrats. Um, the words, Truman Doctrine, Zdanov's uh, two-camp doctrine, the establishment of the common form, we all know about that, and we also know the basic deeds, the uh, the Berlin crisis, which I think was particularly significant in that it drew the line that the United States would not tolerate further encroachments of Soviet power, further moves by the Soviet Union into Western Europe. Uh, the United States did not significantly challenge Soviet control over Eastern Europe, primarily because it could not. It made two attempts. Uh, neither of which uh, has been uh, studied enough. I wish that they, they were, they would be. One was uh, in Poland and one was in Albania. Uh, uh, both terribly unsuccessful. The Albanian operation, which was a joint one uh, by the CIA and, uh, and British intelligence, uh, that failed because from the very beginning it did not have a chance. Of course, Kim Philby uh, was uh, between the Brits and the Americans, the uh, uh, intermediary, and one can imagine, though one does not know as a fact, that he provided some information to the Kremlin and through the Kremlin to the, uh, to the, uh, the Albanians. The Polish operation was also uh, a failure. There, uh, there was an, uh, an, an organization that did uh, work after World War II, WIS, uh, and, 
but pretty soon it was penetrated by Polish special services who then presented the Brits and the Americans in London all sorts of pictures showing how successful WIS was and picked up all the money which they then uh, pocketed. So by and large, there was no good way to undermine Soviet authority in Central and Eastern Europe. And by 1952 or so, uh, the CIA all but stopped uh, uh, trying. Uh, some people left the agency re realizing that, uh, that the communists were far better at protecting their turf than the Nazis had been in the Balkans, such as Frank Lindsay, who was a deputy director uh, of uh, the operational uh, division. And so all that the U.S. could do was to talk. I have referred to this as NATO, no action, talk only. And this particularly started with the Eisenhower administration talking about liberation and rollback, but there was nothing behind that uh, in terms of, of, of actions, and I'll come back to that to describe it uh, in, in just a moment. Until 1953, I do believe as I think most everybody else does, that the line was drawn, the Cold War was frozen. In 1953, after the death of Stalin, something gradually uh, became more complex, or to be more precise, the Cold War became more complex. This was no longer confrontation alone. There were other dimensions or elements in the relationship, and somewhere I, I wrote many, many years ago, that uh, two other dimensions began to be seen, uh, competition and cooperation. Competition primarily in the third world, where money was being spent by the Russians, and then in 55, you will remember, Khrushchev and Bulganin made their trips to India, Indonesia, Egypt, etc., trying to revise and cha indeed change the old Stalinist dictum about either you're with us or you're against us. And so neutralism, non-alignment, became uh, more or less accepted by the Soviets, even as we in the United States um, uh, were less sure whether to, uh, to tolerate such moral uh, ambiguity. Uh, the U.S. probably was uh, more fundamentalist in the first few years than the Soviet Union that was pragmatic, uh, practical. Uh, the U.S. still looked at these countries, of the non-allied countries, as um, uh, uh, countries that should stand up and be counted, of course, with us. Also, at the same time, I would stress that there were some, very few, but some signs of cooperation, the third dimension of the relationship, uh, especially in 1955. This was the time when the Soviets withdrew from Austria uh, to the extraordinary surprise of the world. This was the, the year when uh, Khrushchev and Bulganin went to uh, 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 ask Tito's forgiveness and thus recognize national roads to socialism. Uh, this was the year when there was a summit meeting uh, between Eisenhower and uh, Bulganin and Khrushchev. So, uh, uh, and for that matter, there was even some discussion, to be sure, it didn't lead anywhere, but there was some discussion in the Soviet Union about the future of Germany. Uh, so I would say that, there, that one ought to look at the Cold War as remaining primarily confrontational, but also the other two dimensions began to be felt. There was a lot of confusion about this, uh, these three dimensions, and of course uh, in Washington, London, and perhaps especially in Bonn, uh, uh, not, not so much understanding of what was uh, happening, was the Soviet Union engaged in another deceitful approach, approach and should we not be vigilant uh, in the face of that? And given the brutal history of communism and of the Soviet Union, could you take another peace offensive seriously? That was a, a genuine and, and, and quite understandable reaction to the post-Stalin uh, uh, opening by the Soviet Union. And of course, behind that were some serious reservations from a US perspective. Would they taunt, legitimize the Communist parties of Western Europe? 
would uh, an, a, a new detente undermine Adenauer's anti-communist position in a Germany where, uh, that, where things were not yet uh, uh, very settled. And moreover, should the w West respond uh, strongly to Soviet overtures, what would that mean to uh, the hopes of the East Europeans or the East Central Europeans who wanted freedom and independence and not some deal by the superpowers over their heads. So for these reasons, and I think for a very important domestic reason, the US did not respond in a very forthright fashion to the Soviet, Soviet uh, uh, approach, which I characterized here very briefly, and I apologize to colleagues who uh, would find this uh, superficial. The additional reason that we seldom talk about had to do with American domestic conditions. I think McCarthyism had a major impact on the reluctance of the Eisenhower administration to pick up the Soviet offer and, be and begin serious uh, negotiations. To sum up this, the point that I'm trying to make here, American skepticism, repeated then in Western Europe to a lesser extent, stemmed from a history of communist deception and from confidence that the division of Europe offered a great deal of stability and should not be changed. Very important in this connection is, and very typical in this connection is the response of the United States to Khrushchev's secret speech. There are several people here in the audience who know, know so much more about this uh, than I do. But I, and if they don't agree, I, I am sure they, uh, they will let me know. Uh, Khrushchev's secret speech should have challenged the basic American approach and overcome at least some of the skepticism that the US had about the Cold War becoming a three-dimensional rather than a one-dimensional affair. It did not respond that way. How did the US respond to this extraordinary statement in February 1956? Well, it spent a good deal of time and money to get a copy of it. Frantic search for a source, going to Yugoslavia first and couldn't quite uh, get a copy and then finally getting one uh, through via Poland. But uh, the, there were two possibilities to treat the content of the secret speech. One was to take post-Stalin Russia or post-Stalin Soviet Union seriously and get ready for possible compromise solutions regarding the future of Europe. Which is to say, consider the possibility over a period of years, if not a decade or two, of gradual disengagement and gradual disarmament. The second possibility with respect to the future of Europe was to use Khrushchev's secret speech and the facts of de-Stalinization only to further discredit communism. Uh, I call this the Daje approach. Even, even Khrushchev has to admit. Uh, I don't think anybody used it that way uh, in this country, but probably did. The Daje approach is to quote selectively from the other side's politicians and use that as supportive of what you want to do in the first place. After all, you could ask legitimately, where was Khrushchev himself? when Stalin killed millions of people. How could we believe him now when he says that Stalin did this, 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 and that? So this was the second one, was certainly the dominant US approach. The first one would have been to sit down and talk, negotiate, probe. And there was a summit meeting in Geneva, but not much came of that. And in US foreign policy at that time, I identify three main tendencies, which explain 
or skeptical approach. One is the, what might be called the fundamentalist essentialists, like Secretary of State Dulles, uh, who believed, I use the word essentialist because he believed that the essence of communism is the problem. That must change rather than tactics or even strategies before the US could seriously deal with the Soviet Union. I believe this was a dominant approach, perhaps the dominant one. Then uh, there was a real politique approach within the Eisenhower administration, exemplified by Vice President Richard Nixon, who uh, essentially believed the worse the better. The real uh, uh, cold warrior, but not, not an ide ideological cold warrior so much, uh, he said in July 1956 at a secret meeting of the National Security Council that it would not be an unmixed evil if uh, Soviet forces were to uh, enter uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe and crush any resistance to communist rule. It would not be an unmixed evil. Well, you, you can understand why he said that. He said that because then, uh, uh, then the, the Soviets would be seen for what they are, interventionists, cruel, brutal, and in the psychological warfare that Nixon favored, uh, we would have another, a trump card, as it were, in our hands. There was a third approach, and that I think was Eisenhower's. Um, he, um, he was a chairman of the board. Uh, he did not um, early enough discredit McCarthyism, which I believe was a major mistake. Uh, he was cautious, he was prudent. Uh, he was willing to talk with the, the Russians. He had reservations about Dulles's fundamentalist approach, but in the end, he was unable to impose his will on an administration that um, did not see things quite uh, his way. Now, uh, underneath it all, though, when you add up these tendencies, the United States uh, choice, the real choice that the US made had to do with a desire for victory over communism. Uh, confrontation and not competition or cooperation, certainly. Comp uh, confrontation was seen as the best way to undermine communist rule. Uh, because otherwise, the systems, the communist systems would have stayed, perhaps in a modified way, perhaps one or two could have escaped partially uh, or, or uh, uh, from, from Soviet control. But the idea of just weakening communist rule did not seem to appeal to the Eisenhower administration. Perhaps it had to do more with domestic affairs than with, with foreign affairs, more with ideological orientation, more with fundamentalism. I am not sure. I don't really know enough to, to, to say. But it's clear that the choice between trying to undermine communism and weakening communism, that choice was made. This brings me to the Hungarian Revolution. For the post-Stalin detente that never got off the ground died on the streets of Budapest. It was probably a once-in-history opportunity. In 1953, at the time of the East Berlin riots, there was no chance for the East Berliners to get away from Soviet control, partly because Germany's importance, of course, was so huge, but partly because the Soviet leadership was not yet ready to consider rational alternatives. Later on, once the Gary Powers affair happened, and once Sputnik, already in 1957, threatened the daylight out of uh, the United States, surely there was no realistic opportunity for us to consider making deals with the Russians. In 1968, there was no chance for the very moderate and uh, limited goals of Czechoslovakia uh, to get away from the Soviets for the obvious reason. The Brezhnev regime was well established in its, uh, its uh, uh, semi-Stalinist fashion. 1956 was different. 1956, 55 and 56 represented years of opportunity 
for deal making in, the, in, the, in east west relations, but it didn't happen. This is why Hungary could not obtain uh, some of the limited goals. All of it could never have happened, but some of it, in my judgment, uh, uh, could have happened. I do believe that the basic story of the Hungarian Revolution is accurate today, too. After, after seeing all the archives, and not much more is likely to emerge for decades to come. Certainly, that's the message I got in, in Moscow uh, this week. It's a story of David and Goliath uh, that a small country could not get away from uh, an imperialist power. But then the, in the Soviet archives opened, and particularly in the mid-1990s, the so-called Mullin notes uh, have surfaced uh, that have been brilliantly analyzed by Mark Kramer, who is here, and, uh, and by Janos Reiner, the, the head of the 1956 Institute uh, in Hungary. I should add that the Russian uh, uh, analysts or scholars have not done so well. They have produced the data, the documents, but, uh, but there is little or no analysis that one can rely on. So we have it in English and we have it in Hungarian. What the Malin notes show, sketchy as they are, is that there were deep divisions in the Soviet presidium during the time of the Hungarian Revolution. Uh, that there was a good deal of hesitation, that there were shifting coalitions between uh, what uh, Reiner calls the, the liberals led by Mikoyan uh, and usually supported by Khrushchev, and the others usually led by Molotov and Voroshilov. Uh, but these were shifting coalitions and, and uh, very difficult to pinpoint real factions. I'm sure we will hear more about this tomorrow morning. This is what has prompted me to conclude in, in my new book, uh, Failed Illusions, that a Soviet intervention on November 4, 1956 was not inevitable. I've already given you the reasons, the general reasons for that. Austria, uh, uh, openings, 20th Party Congress, uh, etc. In other words, the post-Soviet leaders were more open to change in the rigid two-camp division of the world, including Europe, than we assumed at that time and that's being assumed by many people still today. But there were more importantly specific reasons during the crisis that suggest to me conclusively that the Soviet leaders were considering other options. They were not trigger happy at all. Khrushchev and especially Mikoyan were deeply, cons were deeply committed to the processes of de-Stalinization and they seem to have understood very well that an intervention in Hungary would give their opponents in the Soviet Union a stronger hand who could point to them and say, you see, this is what you brought about. And this is what they wanted to avoid when they considered giving Imre Noid and his government a chance to put Hungary in order. By what they meant by that is a subject of debate. Surely that did not mean Hungary being able to join NATO. Uh, surely it didn't mean uh, that both the Soviet troops would leave and the Warsaw Pact would, seem, would, would, would not, be, not, not apply to, uh, uh, to Hungary. But some compromise solutions were in the air and were cautiously being uh, considered. On October 30th, in particular, without going through the debates of the, uh, recorded in the Mali notes up to that point, that is the seventh day of the revolution, the Soviet Presidium unanimously voted, in great secret of course, against military intervention. They preferred a political solution, a decision, however, that they reversed the very next day on the 31st. The question is why then did they decide not to intervene on the 30th 
and why they decided to intervene on the 31st. And that's something that we have to, in, in large part, speculate about because there is no cable, there is no report from Budapest to, uh, by, by Mikoyan, Suslov, or, or the Ambassador Andropov, or KGB, GRU cables that would clearly tell us why they changed their mind. We do have Khrushchev's explanation to Tito on November 3rd. And we do have, of course, both Khrushchev's and Mikoyan's memoirs. Putting it all together, which is not conclusive, but I think it is decisive, is the fact that they believed that destalinization was on the line. A second one was the expectation that Imre Nagy, who after all in the 1930s was an NKVD agent, and who was in, uh, after World War II, head of the administrative department which, uh, of, uh, of the Communist Party of Hungary, and as, as such, in uh, supervising the special services and the military. That Imre Nagy will save socialism for the Soviet Union, and over time, political and economic methods uh, by the Soviet Union will keep Hungary in the Soviet camp. And I think another factor uh, uh, against military intervention was the fear that still that day that they might have to intervene in Poland. And if they, if they would have to do that, they, they were smart enough to know that they might not be able to do it effectively in both places. Uh, these are good arguments. Unfortunately, they were inoperative in the famous words of the Nixon White House one day later. What happened? Why was it reversed? Well, it may well be. Somebody after one of my lectures suggested this, and uh, I find it quite possible, though not, not all that telling, is that Khrushchev changed his mind. That he had, he slept on the issue, and then he realized, as he said, it's in the Mullin notes, that our party would not understand the loss of both Egypt and Hungary. Very possible. Uh, he, did, he does say he didn't sleep that night. Maybe. Uh, we do know that he argued with Mikoyan, uh, who, who all the way uh, opposed the decision. What else happened, though? You know, I kept searching. What else happened on the 30th that would have made such a big difference? And here I think the Hungarians themselves had some responsibility. There, was, there were significant atrocities against, against uh, uh, well, communists and, and special services, let me, uh, members of the special services that day, some 20 of them were on lamppost. Uh, it was particularly ugly, I, happened, I was there, I saw that as a young man. And it was unfortunate because some of those uh, young folks uh, wearing the uniform of the hated AVO uh, actually were drafted. So they had no choice but being there. It doesn't mean that they ever tortured anybody or harmed anybody. Uh, that was their assignment. Instead of being, uh, you know, border guards, uh, they were in the special services. So uh, did that news though reach Moscow? Well, one has to assume that such a major event, uh, after all, they were afraid that the Soviet embassy, a few blocks away, uh, maybe two kilometers away, they were afraid that their own security, as somebody just told me in Moscow who was there, they were concerned about their own security at the embassy. So it's only logical to assume that it got there. Another thing that w we know that that day, the Hungarian virus was spreading. It was spreading to uh, Ukraine. It was spreading to Transylvania especially. And so uh, all of this, what plus possibly some influence or some conversations by the Chinese, though I don't think Khrushchev decided this matter as in the end he did because the Chinese did so. Uh, the opportunity provided by Suez, you know, a variety of things I do not know exactly. Uh, what mattered and how much, but clearly in one day they reversed the decision and, and started to crush the Hungarian revolution. The last question that I want to raise here is what did the Hungarians and Americans do that made uh, the success of the Hungarian revolt impossible? Well, I think the answer to both is that both the Americans and the Hungarians rejected half solutions. 
uh, in using a football idiom that I have used now many times, they went for a touchdown instead of trying to carry the ball for four or five yards at a time. Uh, they believed that, uh, that uh, they did not believe that something was better than nothing. They over, the revolutionaries overestimated their power. They believed that their cause was just, which I also believe that it was. Uh, and they thought that that was the only thing that really uh, mattered and uh, they did not consider um, uh, uh, the Soviet uh, response or acted uh, uh, despite it. I don't blame them. Their age was under, tw the average age was 25. Um, and many of them were only teenagers. And I, I, one does not expect revolutionaries coming from a romantic political culture to consider uh, geopolitical realities and act accordingly. That would be absurd. But I don't think it is absurd to expect that from their leaders. And there is no evidence that even once Imre Noyd, who did talk to them, would call in the revolutionary some groups, uh, many of whom, by the way, were socialists in their orientation, most of them were, and said, look, you know, this is where we are, this is where the Soviet Union is. They have so many uh, tanks and soldiers, we're weak, let's work out a solution. Some of what you want, semi-independence, semi-freedom, we can get. We cannot get it all. This was not done, and I think a major chance uh, uh, was missed. What about the United States? Well, I already described American policy as, as maximalist, working for the defeat of communism and not for weakening it. Um, by 1960 or so, after Brzezinski and Griffith published their piece in Foreign Affairs and the Kennedy administration came in, major changes took place and, uh, and the idea was to weaken uh, uh, the communist hold over Eastern Europe rather than to uh, uh, undermine it in any basic kind of way. Uh, but at that time, it was uh, through Radio Free Europe primarily that the United States encouraged the hung Hungarian revolutionaries to, to pursue maximalist goals. Uh, and I, uh, yes, the idea that the Cold War was no longer just confrontation, but it was more complex with the addition of two other dimensions, simply did not carry weight in Munich. The reason for that should be understood, however. It's nothing sinister about this. It's very clear. That station was established in order to undermine communism and uh, as part of a psychological warfare. What else could they have done? They had to do what they were set out to do until stronger orders came from Washington on, uh, by 1960, 61, that the station must change its profile. Aside from RFE, however, the United States did nothing, nothing to help assist the Hungarians. Uh, I did, uh, one of the features of my book is, uh, is, is that I had access to the CIA's operational files for the first time. And by the way, you can read that. Uh, the most important parts are now on the web. It was put on the, uh, on the web by the National Security Archive. I just gave it to them. And so I think yesterday or day before yesterday, it's about 100 pages with some deletions, the usual deletions that the agency does. But it's still very int interesting, and I, I'd urge you to read it to check my own conclusions. Well, here are some of the features of what the CIA did not do. Uh, from 1948 to 52, uh, the agency and its predecessor, the OPC, conducted no covert action operations in Hungary. In 1952, uh, the CIA had no regularly reporting resident agents inside uh, Hungary while its, its uh, uh, attempted cross, so-called cross-border missions either failed or had to be aborted. Uh, 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 from 53 to 56, the CIA had one agent in Hungary who was disguised at the U.S. legation as a political officer uh, and his efforts to obtain and maintain contact with reporting sources were quote-unquote unsuccessful. 
This one agent, who is alive and lives in Virginia, by the way, uh, in an old age home, uh, was directed during the revolution not to get involved in operations. He was told to do such supporting tasks as, I'm not making this up, quote, purchasing stamps and stationery, mailing letters, and generally helping to look after matters of security, end quote. During the revolution, this man was the only Hungarian-speaking official at the legation. Uh, he spent his time opening and closing the legation's door and accepting petitions that Hungarians brought there. Petitions to you know, plead with the US about getting some help or, or another. He put, it, put it briefly, he was a doorman. Um, in nearby countries where the CIA did have agents, it didn't have a single Hungarian speaking agent during the revolution. Uh, as in a French comedy by Moliere, uh, they, the CIA was looking, please look up uh, uh, on the web my evidence, they were looking for uh, some agent uh, who was on vacation somewhere but the CIA's personnel records did not show where the hell this character uh, was and so they couldn't find him and bring him back. Uh, this contrary to many reports, uh, many reports, uh, you know, critical of the, of the CIA, um, the CIA did not have a fighting unit trained and ready to enter Hungary uh, in 1956. Such a unit of about eight to ten Hungarian exiles, nothing very big to be sure, um, uh, these were right-wingers uh, uh, who left Hungary in 44, for, in 45. Um, that unit was disbanded in late 1952. Keep in mind that the, C the CIA transferred its interest from Eastern Europe to uh, the far, far East because of Korea uh, at, about, at about that time. Uh, during the revolt, uh, the White House forbade any agent to enter Hungary, and, but if, even if permission had been granted to transfer arms or ammunition to the insurgents, which was forbidden, uh, by, by CIA headquarters and by President Eisenhower, such a transfer could not have taken place. Incredibly, and I'm not making this up either, the CIA misplaced the record of where in Western Europe it was hiding weapons and ammunition, though eventually they were found. You ask when they were found? They were found in the first week of December 1956, f one month after the Kremlin had crushed the revolution. So the U.S. did nothing. There were no diplomatic moves, no use of possible economic means. Intelligence, uh, as I just described, uh, uh, was not there. It did have broadcasts that were many broadcasts, certainly not all, but many broadcasts uh, pushed the Hungarians towards, uh, towards uh, a final victory. Let me just conclude here by um, uh, by relating two, two stories. One is uh, about RFE. After the revolt in February 1957, there was a staff meeting, a workshop, discussing the lessons for Radio Free Europe. There a staff member asked uh, William E. Griffith, many of you remember Bill Griffith, the radio's political advisor, about what he would do differently in case another revolt was to occur in the region. The staffer wanted to know, would we openly tell that there was no hope? Griffith's answer, quote, not openly, only indirectly. We would let it be known in our new news and commentary programs. And finally, I'm not sure I have that quote here, hope I do. Uh, you may say, well, God, he is now a smart aleck. 50 years later, he finds it all and reinterprets everything. Uh, that may be the case, but let me also say that there were some wise people at that time who understood that accomplishing less is more and uh, advised the U.S. government to be prudent and, uh, and seek less. Walter Lippmann wrote in the Washington Post and Times Herald on October 26, less than three days into the revolt, very wisely, very wisely, 
the following, and I quote, in the interest of peace and freedom, freedom from both despotism and anarchy, we must hope that for a time, not forever, but for a time, the uprising in the satellite orbit will be stabilized at Titoism. Uh, no American politicians in the climate of the Cold War abroad and McCarthyism at home could have accepted that conclusion. Uh, I believe this is the story of 1956 in a Cold War context, and this is the story of my book as well. Thank you very much. Panel, and I don't uh, want to have a major break. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me because uh, the, uh, the the reason for the next uh, longer period that we spend for the next panel is again to leave enough discussion also after the presentations of the panelists. So, are there any questions? Uh, yes, please. And, uh, and, and I'm a lawyer in New York. My name is yes. I think that was a brilliant presentation, but I find a big contradiction there. Uh, Professor Gaddy mentioned how uh, Kim Philby, a communist agent, compromised operations uh, in several countries. At the same time, he attacks Senator McCarthy for bringing out that in our own government, when we were antagonists of communism, we had officials, high officials in our American government, who would not state categorically that they were not communist uh, party members. I think that's a serious uh, mm. uh, contradiction. Perhaps well, Professor, Professor Gatti has already taken some notes. I think uh, if you would like to ask your question. Also, I suppose. Charles said that US policy towards Hungary was maximalist. Not uh, try to exploit these limited chances or opportunities that didn't exist at that time. And I, I agree with this uh, argument, but on the other hand, I would uh, draw your attention to the fact that US policy for the Cold crisis at the same time was much different. It uh, tried to exploit limited goals. It focused on this uh, 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 possibility to have communist, but uh, uh, more liberal and more independent from most regimes. And the uh, US policy really did something to support the uh, Gomuka regime, to help the Gomuka regime consolidate. It gave economic uh, aid, it tried to help uh, the Poles without annoying Russians, uh, without annoying Moscow. So how do we explain such really different or even opposite lines of policies executed by the same people in Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, perhaps one last question, and then I hand over to Professor Gatti. It's more of a comment. I just wanted to say that uh, Columbia University published uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's article on the Cold War in a variety of issues, taking Imre Nagy off the pedestal, and, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and he encouraged me to go on. He, I would say it is fair to, conc to pass on the, the uh, information that he shares my view about the emptiness of, US, of the US foreign policy towards Eastern Europe at that time. Uh, I, 
I don't want to go into further details, let him speak for himself. He certainly writes enough and talks enough to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that, but um, he has no disagreement with me on that issue. Okay. Now, with respect to uh, going backwards, uh, Pavel, uh, well, that's a very important point, the difference with Poland, and I would, um, I would uh, explain it in terms of personalities. The main thing was that Imre Nagy uh, was never accepted by the United States. It's not just RFE at all. But uh, the United States somehow found him to be uh, less of a reformer uh, than, than he actually was. Imre Nagy was a, a very effective reform communist in 53, 55, and yet uh, 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 either in the embassy reports or whatever I have found, I have found nothing positive about him. This may be, and now this is a guess on my part, may be due to the fact that he was a Muscovite, that he had spent the uh, interwar period, or at least uh, the 1930s there. The U.S. government did not know that he was an NKVD agent, to the best of my knowledge. And I think I, I probably would have seen uh, that in the, in the material I was given. So, um, uh, but Gomulka was different. He was, a, he was a nationalist. So I think that one difference was the difference between Imre Nagy that the U.S. mistrusted and Gomulka, who was a communist, but a, a one that clearly was seen by American officials as another Tito. A second difference was the role of Cardinal Wyszynski, uh, who supported Gomulka. And, you know, the appeal of the Polish Catholic Church in, in, in uh, Washington, and for that matter here in New York, uh, was uh, quite considerable. And the third was the, uh, uh, the skill with which Jan Nowak led the Polish desk of Radio Free Europe. I am sure there were many other reasons as well, but uh, the fact remained that, uh, that uh, you are quite right. There was a different approach to Hungary and a different approach to um, Poland. And um, uh, one would wish in retrospect that the same approach that they applied to Poland would have been used towards Hungary. But the fact of the matter that I think for the reasons I just mentioned, this was not the case. Now, as for Kim Philby, uh, I did not say that he betrayed other See, I don't know what secrets he really betrayed, and I am not even sure about the Albanian thing. Uh, he was the intermediary between, well, nothing to do with Poland. The Polish WIS, as far as I know, Philby had nothing to do with that. Um, he did? Was he? I didn't know that. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't know that, thank you. Uh, okay, so he, he was involved in, in both cases. But somebody who knows more about these things uh, than I do said that the, the use, and I'm not an expert on intelligence, uh, that Philby had only so many opportunities to report his findings, and that the Soviet Union, the, his Soviet bosses, were, did not want him to spend his time on explaining or passing on inf detailed information about Albania. They were much more interested in you know, strategic weapons and that sort of thing. Well, be that as it may, I do not know whether and how much he betrayed, and I stand corrected by your uh, perspective that he was active on Poland as well. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the special services of both Albania and especially Poland were very, very effective. And so uh, you didn't have to have a Philby to line up, I know much more about the Albanian operation, to line up the Albanian operation. Now, um, I would probably not agree with the implication of what you're saying, that uh, a few uh, American, Americans in Hollywood that McCarthy was after uh, made some significant difference in how the Cold War was played. No. Okay, well, we can talk about those, those, those in the State Department, and I know, I know their stories reasonably well, probably not as well as you do. Um, I'm very critical, as I take it you might not be, of 
McCarthy uh, violating American civil rights uh, during uh, an era of Red Scare and also uh, of going after people who were uh, not involved or involved in a minor way. Most of the people that he listed did not exist. Uh, some did, uh, and they should have been treated by the FBI in a, in a, in a very strict way and, uh, and excluded from the U.S. government. Uh, but uh, the spirit of McCarthyism I think penetrated American society and did not allow American politicians to um, offer alternatives to what we were doing at that time. That is my great regret that it's in a, uh, there was one thought and only a Walter Lippmann could say something else, but people who wanted to get elected, look, the Demo uh, Adlai Stevenson and the Democratic Party platform in 1956 went further than the Republicans in advocating the liberation and rollback of Soviet power from Eastern Europe. So, you know, and that climate, I think reinforced by McCarthyism, was most unfortunate. It's, by the way, I, I have declined in my book and in my talks, I will make an exception now, to refer to anything uh, contemporary, but the, I, I am, probably shouldn't be saying this, uh, but I do find some similarity here between uh, the way uh, uh, the war in Iraq started and Democrats supported it and the way in the 1950s the Eisenhower administration did not have any opposition to this nonsense uh, called liberation and rollback. Well, uh, thank you very much again. Uh, we already had quite a number of points which I'm sure will be part of our subsequent discussions also. Um, but uh, before I thank Professor Garty again, I had some second thoughts. I think it would be very cruel if uh, I just uh, asked you to stay here now and not to have a five minute break at least so that you can get yourselves a coffee. But before I uh, dismiss you, could I just briefly introduce the chair of the next panel, Professor Nipunshi, who is, uh, who is over there, uh, who is at the Professor of Slavic Literature at Barnard College, also to the director of the Harriman Institute, and we have cooperated closely, and therefore I think she is also, as a Russianist, uh, the ideal person to chair this meeting, and she will, of course, introduce the panelists once we restart. So, five minutes, get yourselves a coffee. Thank you very much again, Professor Gatti. Generous.